West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Well, Democrats in disarray has been a favorite headline of the Washington-based news media for the last several decades. The alliteration is so tempting to headline writers that they have been known to use the Democrats in disarray headline at the slightest provocation, including in many instances when it wasn't even vaguely true. Most Democrats in disarray stories that I have read over the decades have been at best exaggerations and at worst outright falsehoods. And so I've been trying to think all day, more than all day, <laughs> about the word to describe what is happening to Republicans right now. And I, I, I couldn't find it until a little after 7 p.m this evening on Joy Reid's show when Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal delivered the phrase Republicans in ruin. And there it is. That is where the Republicans are tonight. On the night when they won the majority in the House of Representatives. It should be a triumphant night for Republicans. But here's why it isn't. Let's begin with Rupert Murdoch who has been running the media campaign for the Republican Party for decades now. Rupert Murdoch owns the Fox Propaganda Channel, the New York Post, the Wall Street Journal, and right-wing publications around the world. Today, Rupert Murdoch's New York Post, Donald Trump's favorite newspaper, a newspaper whose founder was Alexander Hamilton, published a short article, very short article, on page 26, that is the best piece of writing I have ever read in the New York Post. Now, I didn't read Alexander Hamilton's version of the New York Post, but this is the best piece of writing I've ever read in that newspaper. And it is a flawless description of one element of the Republicans in Ruin story. The headline is, Been There, Don That. With just 720 days to go before the next election, a Florida retiree made the surprise announcement that he was running for president in a move no political pundit saw coming. Avid golfer Donald J. Trump kicked things off at Mar-a-Lago, his resort and classified documents library. Trump, famous for gold-plated lo lobby, ho ho lobbies and for firing people on reality television, will be 78 in 2024. If elected, Trump would tie Joe Biden as the oldest president to take office. His cholesterol levels are unknown, but his favorite food is a charred steak with ketchup. He has stated that his qualifications for office include being a stable genius. Trump also served as the 45th president. Who wrote it? Who delivered this masterpiece of prose? We don't know. It simply says post 
staff report. That just means it is the consensus now of the New York Post. This is Rupert Murdoch, who has injected the most poison to the body politic of America than any media mogul in history declaring war on Donald Trump's presidential candidacy. The New York Post and Rupert Murdoch's Wall Street Journal editorial board have blamed the Republican failures in the elections entirely on Donald Trump. Donald Trump cannot win anything without the full support of Rupert Murdoch and the television players he pays at Fox to say what Rupert Murdoch wants them to say. Last night, Sean Hannity was not allowed to show the entirety of the Trump announcement speech. Everyone else at Fox is rapidly running away from open support of Donald Trump. Sean Hannity will probably tiptoe away more quietly and slowly than the others. But even if Rupert allows one hour on Fox to sort of support Donald Trump, that won't be enough for a candidate who has never been able to win the most votes for president. If you think Rupert Murdoch is the kind of tough, strong media mogul played so brilliantly by Brian Cox in HBO's succession, you would be wrong. Rupert Murdoch is weak. He is unguided by principle. He has taken a stand against Donald Trump before in 2015, one month after Donald Trump attacked John McCain at the beginning of the Trump presidential campaign. Rupert Murdoch tweeted then, when is Donald Trump going to stop embarrassing his friends, let alone the whole country. Rupert Murdoch wanted Donald Trump to drop out of the presidential campaign in 2015. But as Donald Trump increasingly captured the affections of Rupert Murdoch's audience, Rupert Murdoch took his money-making orders from his audience. So no one can count on Rupert Murdoch to remain so strongly in opposition to Donald Trump. But Rupert Murdoch is off to a good start in his attempt to kill the Trump presidential candidacy. Every professional Republican did not want Donald Trump to do what he did last night. Every professional Republican knows that Donald Trump hurt the Republican Party very badly in the last election. He lost governorships, he lost Senate seats, he lost House seats, and very importantly, Donald Trump lost campaigns for Secretary of State in key battleground states where he was hoping to completely corrupt the voting process in those states in future elections. We will be joined later in this hour by the Democratic winner of the election for Secretary of State in Nevada, where democracy was very much on the ballot in that election. After Donald Trump ruined this election for Republicans, no professional Republican wanted Donald Trump to ruin the upcoming runoff election for Senate in Georgia on December 6th. Professional Republicans are all worried that when Donald Trump becomes the issue in a campaign, the Republican loses. So Republicans now expect to lose on December 6th with Donald Trump's candidate Herschel Walker running against Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock. That would give Democrats the clear majority in the Senate of 51. They would not need Vice President Kamala Harris's vote in the Senate to win every vote. Having 51 votes in the Senate means that Democrats will have clear majorities on the Senate committees, which means their legislation will move through those committees faster. And much more importantly, President Biden's nominations of federal judges will move through the Senate Judiciary Committee and the confirmation process much faster. Very little will happen legislatively in Congress in the next two years because Democrats controlling the Senate will find very little to agree on with the House of Representatives controlled by Republicans. Democrats in the Senate might pass some bills to show America what they stand for, knowing that Republican control of the House means that they will never have those votes passed in the House. But what will Republicans do in the House of Representatives when they have control? What legislation will they pass that America will support? The repeal of Social Security that Republican Senator Rick Scott talked about? The repeal of Medicare that Senator Scott talked about? He said he would repeal and replace them, just like the Republican promise with Obamacare. Will the Republicans in the House be able to assemble a majority to pass anything? That is in doubt tonight, because the Republican majority is going to be so tiny 
it is going to and it is going to include some of the very craziest people who have ever served in federal elective office in the history of this country and those crazy people will have power in this republican house of representatives because in the tiny majority as we have seen in the united states senate every member of the majority has power last year if one democratic senator was unwilling to vote for something then it was stuck that will now be Kevin McCarthy's problem in the House of Representatives if Kevin McCarthy is actually able to assemble enough votes to be elected Speaker of the House in January. That is in doubt tonight because of Republicans in ruin. Mitch McConnell survived a vote on his continuing as minority leader of the Senate, but he only got 37 Republican votes when he used to get all of the Republican Senate votes for his leadership. The only things Republicans will be able to do in the House of Representatives is use committees to conduct investigations. They have promised an investigation of Hunter Biden. That would be like having the Benghazi hearings with Chelsea Clinton as the witness instead of Hillary Clinton. The majority of Americans are not going to appreciate Republicans beating up on and humiliating someone who admits his addiction to drugs, someone who was very close to death because of that addiction, and whose problems are in no way connected to Joe Biden's performance as vice president or president. Republicans have also promised to impeach Joe Biden. They are, of course, promising to impeach the president for nothing. If they do that, they are guaranteeing skyrocketing polls for Joe Biden and for Democrats. And the easiest possible reelection for Joe Biden. Consider the example of the Republicans' last impeachment of a Democratic president. As the Republicans conducted their impeachment investigations of Bill Clinton, his popularity skyrocketed to 73%, the very highest of his presidency. And Bill Clinton wasn't legislating anything at the time. He was just getting investigated and attacked by Republicans. And in the 1998 midterm elections, the Democrats gained seats in the House of Representatives because of the Republican attack investigations of Bill Clinton. And so the House Republicans have a choice. Break their promise to impeach Joe Biden or impeach Joe Biden and watch the Democrats take over the House of Representatives again in the next election by a huge margin while Joe Biden wins re-election by a huge margin at the same time. That's the kind of choice Kevin McCarthy is facing tonight with Republicans in ruin. It is Thursday, the 17th of November of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya. A little bit of spice in your life. And it's only a little, so don't worry. Okay, a pinch for another day. Well, 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 I guess uh, this guy Donald Trump is going to run two years ahead of time. Uh, the, The first time that anybody has announced this early. For their uh, run as, uh, I don't know, leader of the free world. Look what he did last time. And he's going to run on how terrible Joe Biden is. Did you look at the job numbers that Joe has had since he's come back? Now, granted, I mean, it's refilling the jobs that were lost during the pandemic. But still, I'm just saying, uh, historic So we have all these historic firsts of what Joe has been able to accomplish, but does anyone know? And then they, they, with a capital T, will accuse Biden and the rest of us of having an issue with messaging. Yeah, we do have an issue with messaging. It would be nice if the media got the message out. I know they're not supposed to be uh, scribes. They're not supposed to just mimic what the administration says, but it would be nice if they could report what is going on. Also, what happened to those caravans of inflation uh, furry gas prices? 
I don't know. Look for the litter boxes in all the schools. They're not there. Yep, disappeared. I read that gas prices are projected to go down as much as 70 cents in some areas. Yep. It's almost like it was a ploy, huh? Yeah, almost like it was. Because it was. Not almost. It was. And we called it out while it was happening. Apparently not enough heard uh, so that we could keep the house. But you know what they say? The Nazism is always greener on the other side. God, she's going to be she's going to be chairing the oversight committee. <laughs> you just know it. I love her excuse for like, well, you know, she's already put the laurels upon her head as chair of the oversight committee. And her explanation when asked, well, well, how is this? And her answer was, well, no one said no. Okay, I guess that's how it used to work in high school. Uh, Okay, once again, always remember the Nazism is always greener on the other side. I got to I have to copyright that I have to patent that I have to like get that so I can get a royalty. Everything is for sale. Everything. Yep. Do. And that's that's a lesson. Don't fall in love with anything. I've been told. Do not fall in love with anything because everything is for sale. And if you love something, you won't be able to get rid of it. Okay, well, if that's the kind of reasoning that those types have, I don't want it. That's why there's a difference between a house and a home. A house you can get rid of, but a home? Yeah, you want to kind of hold on to that. It's priceless. At least in my construct of the universe. I think yours too. All right. uh, You know, these last couple of days, it's been a bit discombobulated. And I apologize. Stumbling over words and all of that. and Meanderings. Well, I could blame it on the dog. Not Gunner. I could blame it on my mom's little Yorkie poo. Oh, Her name is Ginger, and she's gotten quite old, and she needs a lot more care. And that's all right. But, uh, you know, the dog takes some care in the middle of the night. Many times, I can't have my mom locking the dog out in the middle of the night when my mom, well, she's doing really well on that hip replacement surgery, let me tell you. But still, I don't want my 84, soon-to-be 85-year-old mom traipsing around in the dark, probably in her bare feet, too keep telling her but uh so yeah the dog has uh kept me up quite a bit over these last couple of nights and i've noticed as i've gotten older lack of sleep has a profound effect on one's ability to function who knew (laughs) yeah it does so uh there's that excuse I, i i i'm blaming it on the dog And uh, maybe a slight allergy going on, though I looked at the weather report a little early here and they say that there's no pollen out there. Well, there's something. It's dust, maybe. Oh, we are still in an air stagnation warning. That may have something to do with it because it's holding down whatever is, uh, shall we say, toxic and fortunately, my body has an adverse response to poisons and that's what you want you want to get those poisons out and that's why we sneeze get the poisons out ah so excuse me if i have to uh put on the mute button to well sneeze i have no other way of putting it okay well since lawrence had quite a large uh uh, opening there large (laughs) why don't we get into what we have curated for you because we do put up a show uh the night before to you know a little news read for you because that's what we do (laughs) we're a salon put it out there and hopefully it opens up avenues of discussion or insight so as we begin here in the bistro cafe of west coast cookbook and speakeasy on this great metro shrimp and grits thursdays 
Two Republicans who control the elected board in a rural Arizona county have sued their own elections director, who's Republican also, to force a greatly expanded hand count of ballots that could affect certification of the results. They'll do anything to keep democracy from working, won't they? A key Federal Reserve official suggested the central bank will likely slow the pace of its interest rate hikes beginning in December. I told you these caravans of inflation have just disappeared. And the Energy Department awarded nearly $74 million from the bipartisan infrastructure law to advance recycling and reuse of batteries for electric vehicles. And not just that either. After the break, we move to the chef's table where a federal judge handed down a 20-year prison sentence to a Chinese national who was convicted in a U.S. aviation spying case. And a Cambodia wildlife official has been jailed in New York for monkey smuggling. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln, and we thank Kelly for doing so and so much more. To the left uh, from that chat room link across the page at our homepage at netrootsradio.com, there is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio and help us pay our bills, it would really help. It really does. If you could afford to send us what you would spend on an espresso-type coffee drink, for instance, if you could send those funds to us once a month, it really does help us, well, pay our bills and fly under the radar and continue this powerhouse of resistance against dark forces arrayed against all that's right and good. And we call that democracy, representative democracy. All right. So thank you for your, your generosity to those of you who have been so generous over these many years. And thank you to those of you who will hopefully uh, help us in the future because we're not going anywhere. They try to get rid of us, but we're still here. All righty. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, you can do so at Netroots Radio. While you still can, we still have Twitter. I think we're all going to get shadow banned unless we pay up the uh, the tribute. Yeah. Anyway, Tom takes care of our Twitter feed and a hell of a lot more. Thanks, Tom. Follow me on Twitter uh, at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime. And uh, you can find those show notes and links uh, by going through my Twitter feed or just go directly to uh, Daily Co's and find me there. I don't know how easy it is anymore. It used to be pretty difficult. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to find someone. I'll just search their name. And there you go. No results. Anyway, uh, the show notes and links are we are where the real reportage is and uh, and the full articles, too. You can uh, follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. And the deep archive of the Netroots Radio Library can be found at the Internet Archive at archive.org. We're we're Netroots Radio. You can find us there. At that, that's pretty easy. Just put in Netroots Radio, and there we are. All right, this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy on this fabulous Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays is by Bob Christie, 
who writes for the Associated Press. The two Republicans who control the elected board in a rural Arizona county, who we have reported on previous, have sued their own elections director to force her to conduct a greatly expanded hand count of ballots cast in the November 8 elections, a standoff that could affect certification of the results. They want Cochise County Elections Director Lisa Mara to hand over the roughly 12,000 ballots cast on Election Day to the county recorder, an elected Republican. The elected county prosecutor warned the private lawyers representing the two GOP board members that taking ballots without authorization could subject their clients to felony charges. At a raucous board meeting on Tuesday, several members of the public berated the two Republicans on the three-member board for pursuing the hand count and seeking to pay for the case with county funds. One called a board member a demagogue who is making a disgusting sham of the democratic process. The push to hand count ballots in the Republican heavy county in the state's southeast corner, which is home to the iconic old west town of Tombstone, gained impetus from false claims by Trump and his allies of widespread fraud and voting machine conspiracy theories in the last presidential contest. And there has been no evidence of widespread widespread fraud or manipulation of voting machines in 2020 or during this year's midterm elections. Nevertheless, the conspiracy theories have spread widely and prompted heated public meetings in most rural counties throughout the West amid calls to ditch voting machines in favor of paper ballots and full hand counts. The controversies nearly delayed certification of primary results earlier this year in one New Mexico county and have fed an ongoing legal battle over a full hand count in a Nevada county. They want to slow down the process, and then they can complain that the process is too slow, and that's proof of how corrupt the system is. We see you. Now, Republicans in Arizona lost the major races in this year's elections, including for U.S. Senate, Governor, and Secretary of State. Arizona's evolution into a political battleground has angered many conservatives in a state traditionally seen as staunchly Republican. In Cochise County, the Republican candidates for those posts won by wide margins. The Republicans' lawsuit, filed late on Monday, comes a week after a judge blocked the board from hand-counting all ballots cast during early voting, but also gave them space to pursue a wider hand-count. The judge said state law allows the county to expand the small hand-count used for the official audit that is designed to confirm the accuracy of vote-counting machines, provided it's done randomly. After the Republic, after the ruling, Republican board member Peggy Judd proposed an expansion of the hand count to as many as 99% of the election day ballots, although that proposal has now been slightly trimmed. The lawsuit, filed by attorneys for Judd and the other GOP board member Tom Crosby, said they hoped to hand count four races on all ballots from 16 of the county's 17 vote centers. Their lawsuit against the county elections director says she refused their order to either conduct the expanded count herself or hand the ballots over to Republican county recorder David Stevens so he could do the tally. It seeks an order compelling her to turn over the ballots, and all she's doing is following the law. Okay, let's be clear about that. Upping the stakes, the lawsuit contends the Republican board members have concluded that the expanded hand count is necessary to ensure completeness and accuracy before certifying the election. The county's certified results must be received by the Secretary of State no later than November 28. That means 
Time is short to get a court ruling, pull about 12,000 Election Day ballots from the director's possession, and gather more than 200 volunteers. Stephen has said he is ready to do the hand count. Another 32,000 ballots were cast early. If the county misses the certification deadline, the Secretary of State's office or a candidate could go to court and ask a judge to force the board to certify the results. The deadline is in state law, and election rules based on that law say county officials must certify and cannot change the results. Christopher Rugeber of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Christopher Waller, a key Federal Reserve official, added his voice yesterday, Wednesday, to a rising number of Fed officials who have suggested that the central bank will likely slow the pace of his interest rate hikes beginning in December. Waller, a member of the Fed's Board of Governors, said he was open to raising the Fed's key rate by a half point next month in light of evidence that inflation may be cooling. I've imagined that. At each of its four most recent policy meetings, the central bank has raised its benchmark rate by an aggressive three quarters of a point. The cumulative. The cumulative cumulative effect has been to make many consumer and business loans costlier and to risk and the risk of a recession. At the same time, Waller stressed that inflation remains painfully high. Well, that's what price gouging will do to you. And he cautioned that there have been occasions in the past when economists thought inflation was falling only to see prices reverse course and accelerate again. The Fed has raised its key short-term rate this year at its fastest pace since the early 80s. I wonder who was president then. To a range between 3.75% and 4%, the highest level in about 15 years. Those hikes have increased borrowing costs for mortgages, auto loans, and credit cards, among other loans. Fed officials intend the higher rates to slow borrowing and spending and cool inflation pressures. When the inflation doesn't work, let's use a recession. Is that how it's going to be? Well, Waller's remarks followed comments earlier yesterday, Wednesday, from Mary Daly, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Daly said in an interview with CNBC that the Fed will likely raise its short-term rate at least a full percentage point above its current level. She also said there has been no discussion among Fed officials so far about whether to pause their rate hikes if inflation continued to moderate. Both Waller and Daly took pains, like Chair Jerome Powell at a news conference this month, to emphasize that rates will ultimately go higher even as the Fed raises them in smaller increments.
staff at the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. The Energy Department yesterday, Wednesday, awarded nearly $74 million from the bipartisan infrastructure law for 10 projects to advance recycling and reuse of batteries for electric vehicles and other purposes. The funding will go to academic and commercial applicants in seven states, including four in California. Other grant winners are in Nevada, Michigan, New Jersey, Tennessee, Indiana, and Alabama. The University of California, San Diego, will receive $10 million to develop and scale up technology to recycle lithium-ion batteries, while Element Energy in Menlo Park will receive $7.9 million for a wind energy project in West Texas. The company is working with Next Era Energy Resources to pursue commercial scale technology to boost the Second Life battery market for energy storage. Sales of electric vehicles have skyrocketed in the past two years and are expected to continue to rise under the $1 trillion infrastructure law signed last year and the climate and health law adopted in August. With demand for critical battery minerals such as lithium and graphite projected to increase by as much as 4,000% in the coming decades, this latest round of funding supports the recycling and reuse segment of the domestic battery supply chain, the Energy Department said. The project should help accelerate battery production in America, mitigate battery supply chain disruptions, and create good-paying jobs, officials said. The announcement follows $2.8 billion in grants awarded last month to bo- to boost domestic manufacturing of EV batteries in 12 states. A total of 20 companies will receive grants for projects to extract and process lithium, graphite, and other battery minerals, manufacture components, and strengthen U.S. supply of critical minerals. The announcements support President Joe Biden's goal for electric vehicles to make up half of all new vehicle sales by 2030. Thank you, Joe. All right, let us now go to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Shayla Love. When you hear a bee buzzing along visiting a flower, you're hearing the movement of air made by the fluttering of its wings. But it turns out that bees are buzzing in more than one way. I first saw this when I saw a bumblebee land on an electrode I was using, and I saw a real change in the measurement. And I thought, this is a charged thing. That's Giles Harrison, a professor of atmospheric physics at the University of Reading in England. He's co-author of a recent paper in iScience that measured the electric charge of swarms of bees and found that the insects can generate as much electricity as storm clouds. We know for quite a long time already that uh, uh, bees uh, carry an electric charge. Ellard Hunting is a biologist at the University of Bristol in England, and he studies how different organisms use those electric fields in the environment. Plants and pollen tend to be negatively charged, and bees are positively charged. The bee visits a flower, and the pollen are actually electrostatically attracted to the bee, and so they stick better, and they transfer better. 
There are several honeybee hives that are used for research at the field station at the University of Bristol School of Veterinary Sciences. Those bees sometimes swarm, and that's when the researchers were able to directly measure from them using an electric field monitor. Bees can also electrically sense whether a flower has been visited by another bee who already took its nectar. But until now, it hadn't been considered that living things flying around in the atmosphere could make an impact with their own charges. Now, an individual bee's charge is minuscule. It takes a lot of bees to generate enough electricity to make an impact. Imagine that you need like a billion of those to light up an LED. 50 million million bees to uh, get enough charge to start a car. But altogether, because there are so many insects in the atmosphere, they can have a massive effect. This means that bees and other large groups of insects are capable of changing the atmospheric electric fields around them, potentially impacting things such as weather events, cloud formation, and dust dispersal. Insects are not the only living thing that spend time in the atmosphere. Birds and microorganisms carry charge too and take up space in the lower atmosphere. Even before the bees were measured, we knew that the sky was filled with electricity. These static electric fields are found everywhere in Earth's atmosphere, and they can be swayed by rain, lightning, aerosols, pollution, volcanoes, and possibly earthquakes. Atmospheric electricity is measured as something called the vertical potential gradient, or PG, which is the difference in voltage between the surface of Earth and any point in the air. The team found that the swarms of bees could change the PG by 100 to 1,000 volts per meter. They also modeled how atmospheric electricity might be impacted by other insects, such as desert locusts, which can form swarms of up to 460 square miles. These swarms are dense enough to cram 40 million to 80 million of the insects into less than half a square mile. Based on past measurements of locust electrical charges, such swarms create more charge than reported for electrical storms. Not all insects pack such an electrical punch. In the modeling, moths and butterflies don't seem to have a big impact because of their relatively low densities. Right now, insects' electric charges aren't accounted for in climate models that look at complex interactions in the atmosphere. They probably should be. The combined electric charge of all of these insects might impact the development of rain, snow, and droplet formation, and maybe even how clouds are made. We can only speculate, but like, that might have an impact on cloud formation. And if there's a direct link between insects and cloud formation, then we know that clouds are relevant to climate. Insect electricity could also be influencing how dust moves around the atmosphere. This is something that atmospheric scientists are interested in because such dust cuts off incoming sunlight and can change temperature distributions locally. The link between dust and insects is very interesting because one of the um, questions in climate change is how is it that large particles uh, move from the Sahara? Um, And we've just thought about it in terms of the physics of transporting them from the Sahara, and they're found a long way away. What if they're stuck to a locust because they're charged? That, That really changes things, and we can think about it very differently. After learning about how much of a spark these insects can generate together, it may be time to start taking into account all that extra buzzing up in the air. For 60 Second Science, this is Shayla Love. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Arthritis is common among veterans. Traumatic and overuse injuries during active duty are risk factors for developing arthritis. Fortunately, there are low-cost or no-cost strategies that can help veterans manage arthritis. Physical activity can reduce pain and improve function. It can also help improve mood and play a role in managing other chronic conditions, such as heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. You can do low-impact activities, such as walking, biking, swimming, and water aerobics, all good forms of exercise. Arthritis-specific classes can help you get started. Information on classes, exercise programs, and tools are available at cdc.gov arthritis. These resources can help reduce pain and improve function. Learning self-management techniques can help all veterans become more active, improve their overall quality of life, and thrive. 
For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. He seems sorry. We very clearly told him not to look up there. I'm honestly impressed that he was able to do it. Right? What did he balance on that big chair? Or... Yeah, I mean, I guess he'll just know what his gifts are this year. I really thought we had hidden them well. If they can find their presence, they can find a gun. 911, what is your emergency? Every day, eight kids and teens are unintentionally killed or injured by loaded and unlocked guns. Learn how to make your home safer at nfamilyfire.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and N Family Fire. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. As fall turns to winter, the flu season will be upon us in force. The best way to avoid influenza is to get immunized. Everyone six months and older should be vaccinated. Those at increased risk for flu complications include children under the age of 5 and adults 65 and older, people with chronic health problems such as heart disease, asthma and diabetes, and pregnant women. To get your annual flu vaccine, see your health care provider or go to a pharmacy, grocery store or clinic in your area. If you get influenza, talk with your health care provider right away about antiviral medication. Thank you for joining us on A Minute of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our netrootsradio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. This Civil Liberties Minute is about abortion and the midterms. I'm ACLU of Massachusetts Attorney Bill Newman. In November, the right to abortion was on the ballot in five states. In three, California, Michigan, and Vermont, voters were asked whether the right to reproductive choice should be enshrined in their state constitutions. And in all three states, again, California, Michigan, and Vermont, voters voted to include in their state constitutions the guarantee of reproductive choice, just as 60 percent of the voters in Kansas did last summer, just as the federal constitution did before this Supreme Court reversed Roe. Also on the ballot in November in Kentucky and Montana were proposals to restrict or prohibit abortion, and in both of those states, the ban or restriction lost. In sum, for the midterm elections, five victories for reproductive choice, five wins, and no losses. But many states now prohibit abortion, or most abortions, and some politicians are pledging to enact a federal ban, and this Supreme Court will have a huge say in the future of the right that some states still protect or guarantee, the right of women, and not the government, to make their decisions on reproductive choice. In sum, the reversal of Roe remains a huge loss. But as the midterms show, fights for reproductive freedom can still be won. The struggle continues. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU, because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1947. That was the day the Screen Actors Guild voted to make all SAG members take an anti-communist loyalty oath. The late 1940s were the dawn of the U.S. Cold War with the Soviet Union. Anti-communist hysteria swept the nation. Hollywood became an early target of the communist witch hunt. Just a few days before the Screen Actors Guild vote, a group of screenwriters and directors, known as the Hollywood Tech, were called before the House Un-American Activities Committee. This group denounced the House Committee's trial. For that, they were sentenced to a year in jail and then blacklisted. 
The anti-communist backlash had a chilling effect on Hollywood. Many in the movie industry were progressives, and some had actually attended meetings and other activities held by the American Communist Party. However, few of these movie industry people had actually identified as communists. The Screen Actors Guild attempted to head off continued congressional investigation by requiring union members to take a loyalty oath. Ronald Reagan was president of the Screen Actors Guild at the time it decided to implement the oath. Those who were blacklisted saw their careers disintegrate. Many screenwriters wrote screenplays under assumed names. One notable movie, The Salt of the Earth, was made by people who had been blacklisted. The movie was a true story about a 1951 zinc worker strike in New Mexico. The Hollywood Reporter declared the movie was made, quote, under direct orders of the Kremlin. Blacklisted writer Dalton Trumbo finally was able to write a screenplay under his own name thanks to actor Kirk Douglas. Douglas supported Trumbo to write the screenplay for the acclaimed film Spartacus. He insisted Trumbo use his own name. Sadly, far too many were not so courageous during the Red Scare. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 28 degrees Fahrenheit under foggy conditions, and uh, we'll have a bit of cloudy skies after the fog lifts, and then followed by partial clearing later. Highs in the low to mid-50s, winds light and variable. Partly cloudy skies overnight with lows in the upper 20s, low 30s. Winds remaining light and variable, and then sunny skies tomorrow. Highs in the low to mid 50s. Winds will have picked up out of the east at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Apparently, there's no pollen out there in Rogue River proper, but the air quality index is in the unhealthy range at 102 parts per million. We are under an air stagnation advisory. And the daytime UV index is low at level 2. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.34 inches. Visibility is at one quarter mile. And relative humidity is at 99%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 53 degrees and mostly cloudy. Paris is 55 and cloudy. Rome is 65 and partly cloudy. Kiev is 29 degrees and cloudy. Kabul is 37 and clear. Hong Kong is 75 and fair. Tokyo is 55 degrees and fair. Sydney, Australia is 54 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 48 degrees and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 45 degrees Fahrenheit and partly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Thank you. 
Andrew Welsh Huggins of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A federal judge handed down a 20 year prison sentence to a Chinese national who was convicted of trying to steal trade secrets from multiple U.S. aviation and aerospace companies, including the theft of proprietary airplane engine fan technology. Judge Timothy Black in Cincinnati rejected arguments by Yanjun Shu's attorneys that a long sentence was too harsh, and the just under five years that Zhu has served since his arrest was sufficient punishment. Prosecutors had asked for a 25-year sentence. This case sends a clear message. We will hold accountable anyone attempting to steal American trade secrets, Kenneth Parker, U.S. Attorney of the Southern District of Ohio, said in a statement. A message was left with Zhu's attorney seeking comment. The government alleged that beginning in December of 2013, Zhu recruited experts who worked at aviation companies, including GE Aviation in Cincinnati. Federal prosecutors described him as a deputy division director at the Chinese Ministry of State Security, the country's intelligence and security agency. In that role, he and others would pay stipends for experts to travel to China under the guise of delivering a university presentation, the government said. Specifically, Zhu was accused by the government of trying to steal technology related to GE Aviation's composite aircraft engine fan, unduplicated by other companies, to the benefit of Chinese government. Zhu, age 42, was arrested in Belgium in 2018 after traveling there to meet a GE employee in Europe on business. The government says the employee was not charged and was later extradited to the United States. Zhu was charged with conspiring and attempting to commit economic espionage and theft of trade secrets and convicted last year of all charges after a two-week trial. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers David Fisher and Joshua Goodman of the Associated Press bring us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Federal prosecutors have charged eight people with smuggling endangered monkeys, including a Cambodian wildlife official who was arrested in the U.S. while traveling to a conference on protecting endangered species. The official, plus a colleague in that country's wildlife agency and six people connected to a Hong Kong-based company, were involved with breeding long-tailed macaques for scientific and academic research, supplying them to labs in Florida and Texas. But the group is accused of illegally purchasing wild macaques for the business when they lack supply from their breeding operations. Long-tailed macaques, sometimes known as crab-eating macaques, are protected under international law and special permits are required to import the animals into the United States. Masfal Cree, the Deputy Director of Wildlife and Biodiversity in Cambodia's Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, was arrested yesterday, Wednesday, at John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York. Cree, age 46, uh, was traveling to Panama to attend an international 
meeting on regulatory trade in endangered species, said a U.S. official, Omalis Kio, age 58, Director General of the Southeast Asian Countries Forestry Administration, is also charged in the eight-count indictment, along with the six Vanny employees. Officials did not say whether anyone besides Cree had been taken into custody. They each face up to 145 years in prison. The long-tailed macaque is the most heavily traded primate on the endangered species database, almost exclusively for laboratory research. More than 600,000 were exported and declared born or bred in captivity from 2011 to 2020. Almost 165,000 live specimens were exported in 2020 alone. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. And don't we deserve it? So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TF, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver